record on the screen. Okay, we are recording, Connor. Um, All right. And so what I wanted to talk to you is about the political implications of the stock market. And you are like my main, as the guy who broke the needle, <laughs> you are my main go-to guy understanding just the political winds and where things are, are, are shifting. And I wanted to start our conversation on the following. You remember how James Carville was famous for saying that if he wanted to be reincarnated, he wanted to be reincarnated as the debt market. And my question to you is, if James Carville was in the active in the political game now, would he say the same of the equity market? I think he would say yes, but Democrats are trying to change that. You think they are? I think that it's not that they want the market to go down, but I think they want to change fiscal policy such that the market can go down without the whole world collapsing. Okay, and so I'm curious, I wanna challenge you on that because, well, I wanna challenge you from the perspective of one of the most interesting phenomenons and there were many of them from the Trump presidency is how he viewed and communicated his success as a presidency through what the Dow was doing or through what the market was doing. And they pounded that message home and pounded that message home, including that if the Democrats won, it would be really bad for business. I actually think they were so successful because I had people who weren't necessarily, you know, Republicans or died in the wool Trump fans who were worried when, when by, or at the prospect of Biden winning. So I'm curious of how they respond to that, that messaging. How, how do you, how, how do you, is that, was that just like a weird four year interlude? No, I, I think that the, the market focus has been a long time coming and it's been in response to, you know, trend, all kinds of trends. And so I think it's very well ingrained, but I think that, and I don't think any Democrat would say we're trying to make the market go down or anything like that. But I think if you think about how they're trying to achieve economic goals, which are full employment, you know, the Fed trying to get inflation at 2%, um, and, you know, before you get even getting into Green New Deal and these sorts of social goals, it's really using fiscal policy much more robustly than has been used in decades. And I think that if they're successful with that, then if the market were to go down somewhat, it wouldn't have the same sort of multiplier effect on everything that it has for the past several years. I, I hear what you're saying. I'm wondering, though, when I see on tip. TikTok or the various TikTok videos about spending my stimmy checks. Yeah. Uh, how much because of COVID, you know, and because of whether people are bored, I like that boredom hypothesis that I think Matt Levine has, uh, has, has uh, theorized that if there's just so many more people playing the stock market, trading the stock market, I'm more interested in the political ramifications of are these people just dabbling and they're going to move on or um, with the fiscal stimulus, which a lot of it is just checks, you can see it, it's going into the markets. So right. well, do these people I, vote or blame politicians, um, you know, if, if they stop making money? I mean, it might be a little bit. Okay, so let me let me paint you a picture so we can sort of talk about a scenario where Democrats spend, say, three to five trillion dollars on fiscal policy over the next two years on a variety of things. The economy reopens after vaccines and we get unemployment down to three and a half percent. Wage growth is four percent and inflation is two and a half percent. And so we have the economy is now finally meeting its employment and inflation goals for the first time in our careers. And then based on that, we start to see stocks go down while the job market and inflation are fine. I, I think, you know, will the Fed step into that? Will the government step into that? And I think if they, 
if the job market and inflation were to stay where they are, I think they'd be comfortable watching the market go down somewhat. We have to get there. And, we haven't gotten there. And so what I wonder is that if you have like a 1987 event, right? like later this year, and you have the, let's just say it's not even this year. Let's say that it's, you fast forward a year and it's right, you know, we're ge gearing up for the 2022 uh, elections, midterm elections, and the market is weak. And well, I, I think if, if you're talking about a crash or something that destabilizes financial conditions, financial conditions are then seen as part of the economy and credit spreads. And, and so that's the overlap. So if it's, if it were just Apple going down 50% and everything's fine, I think they're okay with that. But if like, you know, the VIX were to spike to 50 and credit spreads were to blow out, then they would step in. Yes. And what I'm interested in is I'm interested in, do you also believe that any of these newly minted Robin Hood or Wall Street bets, Reddit people, do they become a political force in your mind? Or is this just at the edges? I think that for now it's at the edges. Like, you know, GameStop's market cap with, you know, games, I don't know when you're going to air this or whatever, but it's gone up several hundred percent over the past week. And its market cap is a few billion dollars. And maybe the, the you know reddit type robin hood people who have made money in this maybe their combined winnings are in the tens of millions i don't know that on its own is not enough to make a political force especially if they're younger and maybe not very politically active so i don't think we're there yet um and i don't think they're a really important political constituency i think for now it's kind of this fun thing on the edges my my thought though is that psychologically if the market just the stock market is just a little weaker that you could have the opposing side use that as a as a political ad so to speak as i told you you would lose money um and it may not be effective but it's just a theory of mine is that that would be a worry uh well, in I, future I, elections i think what's interesting is that you know, both parties at least say that, you know, they don't want to be Wall Street focused, they want to be more Main Street focused. And, you know, even Joe Biden on the campaign trail said, yeah, the, the stock market went up, but workers are suffering. And so the rhetoric is still much more at, and in fact, I would say the rhetoric has become more Main Street focused over the past 10 years. So it would be interesting if we actually accomplished that. Like, let's say this year that the job market showed a, grew a ton of jobs and the market went down 10%. If we get that simultaneously, how the messaging would go, um, because that, that would be fascinating. I would I would be fascinated to see what the what that is. And, and again, I'm not what I wanted to make sure from our conversation is kind of remove what at least my opinion or your opinion is or what the right thing is. You know, we're putting that to a side sure. and I'm just thinking more of political messaging and what pe what is viewed as vulnerabilities and it's right. it's well, interesting yeah, if, to think in that standpoint. if we added if we added five million jobs in the market went down 10 percent, how would the country feel about that we haven't really seen something like that in, in decades so i think that would be a, an interesting thing to think about later in the year yeah how do you think about so what's so fascinating is watching you know the robin hood wall street bets option playing and then I was so excited to see this news right before we were supposed to talk. But then you see Nancy Pelosi buying like a half a million, I forget if it's a half a million or a million dollars of Tesla options. What is going on there? When I first saw that, I thought it was fake because I thought there's there's no way the Democrats upon retaking Washington would be you know, speculating, like the Speaker of the House would be speculating in Tesla call options. So I haven't heard if she had put out a quote on that because it just doesn't, it didn't make any political sense to me at all. So I still, it's hard to even have a comment because it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And it was, it's also interesting how much stock trading uh, played into the political campaign because I know that in the Georgia, Georgia runoff, that and the the previous Senate election, it did play in that the Kelly Loeffler, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, um, did sell her stocks during the pandemic while saying everything was fine, and that appeared to be used uh, effectively by her opponent. 
and and David Perdue actually as well that he is I think by far or was by far the most active investor in the Senate oh. over the past several years and he had gotten in and out of a couple stocks like eight or nine times so he was almost a day trader senator and I wonder is it them like the other thing that if I had a chance to talk to Nancy Pelosi or David Perdue is it is it is it really them or is it some advisor or is it a, a mix of advisor and them are are they actually like I don't even know where they find the time to do it but like you know they seem pretty busy. Uh, I, well, with I, Lef I, with Leffler in particular, I mean she's married to the head of the New York Stock Exchange, so you know she would think both from a, a family standpoint and a political standpoint, it, it would seem kind of reckless to not be aware of what was going on. Yeah. Do you think that during the next crash that the, uh, the, the government in whatever form it takes, uh, whether it's central bank or treasury, do you think uh, that the government's, the US government starts buying stocks? Probably not. I think that they're gonna continue. I mean, I think what they did in March was quite effective without having to go that far. One of the interesting things about the, what the Fed did in March was they never really bought much in the way of corporate debt or junk bonds. All they had to do was was talk about it, and that you know sort of set expectations where the market kind of took over from there. So I, I think if the Fed were to say we're exploring, you know, ETFs or something like that, that might be enough of a signal for the market to step in and then stabilize things from there. Because I look at this is remarkable the Japanese central bank owns $400 billion of Japanese stocks. It's just a remarkable figure. I want to say yeah, they own like 90% of the ETFs or some crazy number like that. It seems like what, what the Fed has figured out is they, they only really want to own treasuries and agencies, but as for risk assets, they are willing to you know, give, give language that can prop up the market without them actually having to go in and buy a whole lot. So they might only have to buy a billion or two of, of securities for the market to say, okay, they're money good. And then the prices respond and the private market sets the price in there. So that, that's sort of the way that they can, can get involved without actually having to own them. Like, so it's sort of like if I said yeah. to you, I'm going to buy your house at X price. You know, I don't actually have to buy, the, buy your house. It's just that now you know that there's a bid. And so the market responds. Yes. No, no, no. And that, it, I, I'm more interested because I wrote this post that I emailed to you and I, this is what, uh, pushed us to talk was this idea of stock market nationalism. And you kind of look at this trend and from when I started in, um, or even before when I started, or, you know, the SNL crisis, they just came in and bailed out the, the SNLs. And then in uh, 1998, they got uh, the Wall Street banks together to help long-term capital management that was over levered. And then the, the, the dot-com, and uh, crash and lowered interest rates go through to the housing crisis and they step in and bail out companies. Um, you know, now, you know, you know, COVID and they're sending checks, buying, you know, signaling that they're buying. Uh, you have the last 10 years of the treasury buying program. Um, it's not that far fetched to me that where we're headed in the next crash or the next crisis or whatever that they would buy stocks do well, you think, I think that i'm wrong in in viewing it the kind of that long-term trend of the I think involvement if, we don't, if i'm wrong about fiscal policy and we we keep doing fiscal policy the way we have been doing with people focused on the debt and the deficit and bad fears of inflation then i think your your scenario is probably where we're going just because you know i think a lot of economists say the only way we get out of this is to truly just spend a ton of money to, to generate growth that way via the, the government like balance sheet. And if we don't do that, then you just get central banks more and more involved in financial markets to prop up the economy that way. So I, I think it's sort of an either or. Um, mm. And it, you know, for, for someone like you, I, I think you're more deficit averse than I am. And maybe, so maybe you're a little more hesitant to, to buy in on the fiscal policy and, that, and that's sort of the disconnect here. Oh, no, 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 it's, it's not that. I'm actually approaching it from, I have when, so, so let me explain where I'm coming from. 
I want to know when, what event or what process stops governments from this longer term trend of intervening in supporting financial markets? I think that it's the one of the most important questions to any kind of investor. And instead of saying, hey, I spot speculative excess, which is an important thing to watch for, and we are definitely seeing froth and speculative excess, what I'm more interested in is what's going to stop governments from fostering this environment where you constantly have speculative excess. And I think the and answer so, is spending enough money. And you know, ah, if that means the, the, the deficit needs to be $10 trillion, then the deficit's $10 trillion. And then they get to a point where they don't have to intervene. So this is, thank you for, that's what I wanted to know. And I see all of these, and part of this, and I was having, you know, I, I made some comments to this, uh, to this on Twitter is I, I, when the Federal Reserve Chairman came out on 60 Minutes and said, I will do anything and everything to support the market last May, I believed him. Yeah. And I literally took off every short because to me, that was, you could not say anything or do anything more of a like, hey, we're, we want the markets to go up. And I have been, you know, even if you can actually see the short interest falling, they're accomplishing what they want. Yeah. To me, Game, GameStop is just yet another example of like, why would you short things when the conditions are kind of perfect for massive mania and speculative? And so what I think I hear you saying, I've been thinking more of something happening that causes the government to say, hey, everybody, we have to stop doing this for the common good and do this. Um, but I think what I hear you saying is that if, if the government starts focusing on fiscal, the economy starts roaring, the government can then say, hey, we don't need to do this anymore because we got everybody where we wanted. Is, is, yep. is, that, is that correct? That's exactly right. And do you think that, that, that if that were to happen, let's just say, and, and the numbers don't matter, but let's just say that the, the government in general decided they were going to spend $10 trillion on, you know, the Green New Deal and sending people checks and, um, you know, infrastructure and all this stuff. And we got to full employment and, and good running inflation that the, that do you believe then that the, the, the speculative market excesses would be burned off? I do. I, I think that if you, one of the interesting industry sort of cross correlations over time is between commodities and tech. And I hadn't really thought about it that much, but when commodities are hot, tech stocks tend to suffer and vice versa. And I don't think there's an economic reason for that. I think it's more of a portfolio flows reason for that. So if, if commodities are going nuts, then people start chasing commodities. And if they're in commodities, then you, know, you can't have speculation in too much stuff at once. So, you know, in the late 90s, when tech was going crazy, commodities were, were pretty poor. And then in like the 2000s, when the bricks and commodities were going nuts, tech was kind of in the toilet. And then, you know, the, more recently this decade, ever since oil busted, that's when the fangs took off. So um, I, I think if we got that kind of growth in inflation, we'd see commodities maybe do better. And that would shift the froth from, you know, I don't want to say fake companies, but a lot of the, the SPACs and the things we're seeing back to old world real economy stories. I'm not sure I totally disagree. I, I agree with part of it because I think my my own sense is that if you did have inflation running in the three, four or 5% range or something more than what we have now, that you would have interest rates go up to some more normal, historically normal level and that that would be the limiting factor. Um, one of the things where my own thinking has changed is more on the more money we spend on these bubbly areas like electric vehicles, battery technology, all of these things, it, it is actually going to um, accelerate the dec the use cases of maybe not, or, or just like energy. I don't know if you follow Gregor McDonald at all. He I do, yeah. a very compelling case for what's going on with renewable energy. So it's interesting on that side note, but I, I hadn't thought about
the fact that if you could get the fiscal stimulus, um, that that would be the end of um, kind of the speculative, the speculative nature. But maybe it, we're both right. You get commodities and you get well, interest rates. Well, I think it would be a, I think it'd be a transition, right? So when you're in these overlapping regimes, you have some people who believe we're in a new era, and some people who are you know, still holding on to the old era. So I think that transition could be really interesting. Like in, in the early 80s, I'm sure that you at, probably asked the average person, what should I invest in? And they'd say, oil's down 50% by the dip rather than buy bonds and buy stocks. So I, I think you could be in this world where people keep trying to hold on to this maybe VC yeah. speculative regime and aren't bought in yet. Yeah, I know you, the same thing could be said of like the last thing you'd want to buy is treasuries, you know? Yeah, yeah, you know, sure. in, in the early 80s. No, that that's 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 really interesting to think. Do do you think that? How much do you subscribe to the boredom hypothesis in terms of people just being bored and uh, trading stocks versus maybe the idea that things have been more democratized and you're going to have greater participation going forward in stocks with, from more retail people. There's probably both. I mean, I, I think that, you know, even after the dot-com bubble burst, we still didn't go back to the old stuffy days where it was $100 per commission. And so I think that democratization is here to stay. The question is just, you know, people are always chasing the, the hot new thing. And right now it's, it's SPACs and tech stocks. And then two years from now, it might be cannabis. And after that, it's something else. So I don't think it's going to be small dollar call options that will hold people's fancy forever. Yeah, no, I, 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 I think you're right. Um, when I going more to you, so I feel like you're at this interesting nexus um, that you have your own, uh, you know, money management firm. If I'm correct, you're a Bloomberg columnist, yep. and so uh, can you just give a plug for the things that you do? um if people don't know you and they should know you and should follow you but <laughs> can you give just a plug of the various things you're working on yeah so i i started a, a registered investment advisor in 2020 and managed money for individuals um, and high net worth for the most part and then i written a column for bloomberg for four and a half years related to the economy and markets and demographics and housing and so i do think there's kind of a, a nice synthesis there where you're thinking about columns, which can inform investing and thinking about investing, which can inform columns. And, and it, you know, sometimes one side of the world is busy and the other one's slow. So it kind of gives you something to focus on at all times. And what do you think is the most undervalued or if you ever listen to Tyler Callen's uh, podcast, what is the most underrated thing either in politics or the economy that people are not paying attention to? I think it is this shift that we finally break out of this 40 deck, 40 year period of lower inflation, lower interest rates, a monetary policy focus, and more to a, you know, using fiscal policy as the main engine to stimulate the economy and manage the business cycle. And what that would mean, both from a policy standpoint, from an economy standpoint, and from a market standpoint, I think, you know, it's, it's not totally clear we're going to get there this year, but we're moving in that direction. And so I think it's worth thinking about what that new environment would look like. And, and in your own view, what does that look like? I, I, so, you know, I think the, the biggest thing is just that, you know, it's sort of unclear to me how much of the, the big tech story of the past decade was, you know, tech itself being so disruptive or just being in a generally slow growth environment where, you know, all of the, the net profit growth went to these disruptive uh, upstarts. And if you have a much more robust growth environment, actually gives the incumbents some time to compete and catch up. Like we've seen companies like Walmart, which have, they have enough cash flow and, and resources to adapt and, and catch up to Amazon. But a lot of companies just haven't had a, a robust enough growth environment to really invest in new opportunities. And so I think that, you know, I think a lot of the, the upstarts might lose their competitive advantage in a faster growth environment where upstarts or sorry, incumbents actually have the profits and, and resources to, to keep up. So are you are you are you thinking then that we may see more like mean reversion? That would be that would that would seem to make an argue for 
uh, change from growth to value. One of my big fears and wondering is, is that because of the, the, the nature of uh, the internet and power law, it's kind of like extreme power law distribution that you have winners keep winning and we're not seeing this mean reversion. Are you now, uh, are, are you proposing that if we, end, if we do go into this new period that you will see more mean reversion and you could see a tremendous comeback in value? Well, I think that, you know, the, a lot of the, the reason why US markets outperformed so much in the 2010s were that commodities were pretty weak and that's, you know, commodity stocks tend to be more international and focused and, and a lot of the growth in global equity valuation was a handful of large cap tech stocks. And so even though US economic growth itself wasn't very robust, these your Amazons and Apples put on so much market value that US stocks outperforms. But I think if you look, think about the entire decade and what does global growth look like, you know, you have the demographic story in Europe and in Asia where their populations are shrinking. And, you know, even in China this decade, you're going to see a, a pretty significant decline in their working age population. And in the U.S., if we get this shift in fiscal policy, then, you know, the U.S. could actually be the leader in sort of contributing to global GDP growth in the 2020s. And so we could get an interesting dynamic where maybe U.S. tech stocks underperform, but U.S., you know, economic growth outperforms. So there's just a, a big shift towards U.S. financials and industrials and, and consumer stocks. That's interesting. Can you talk, I, this is something that we tweet back and forth on Twitter. Um, one of, I think one of the most undervalued uh, aspects of what's going on is what's going on in the housing market. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could just talk about your view on what's happening in the housing, what's going to happen in the housing market this year and how it relates to the economy. I think it's one of the most underreported stories and it's just the people, sheer size, but I, I'm curious of what what you would say. I think people don't understand just how good the tailwinds for the U.S. housing market are, and it's because you know we we think back to the mid 2000s when it was really due to to speculative buying and and leverage and bad mortgage underwriting, and so we think anytime we get eight to ten percent home price growth, it's due to unsustainable factors. Where I, I think that. The, the, the supply situation in the U.S. housing market, there are so few homes for sale that uh, Mike Simonson of Altos Reachers Group just put out his weekly uh, sort of breakdown of the housing market. There are 380,000 single family homes for sale in the entire country right now. And granted, we're at the seasonally lowest point of the year for that, but that's probably not going to get up to more than, say, a half million homes or so by the peak of the spring buying season. At the same time that you have record low mortgage rates. Um, you know, strong buying demographics for millennials and, and younger Gen X people looking to buy homes and, you know, fiscal stimulus and maybe home buyer credits from a new administration and, you know, pandemic reopening of the economy. It's, it's sort of a, a situation where I don't know how high home prices can go just because there's going to be no supply and so much demand that it's sort of prices have to go to where, you know, demand and supply can, can transact. And that just could be at a, a level that's just maybe ridiculous, but that's where it goes. And, and I just, and, and I'm curious if I, I talk to people in, in their, 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 there are investors and smart people out there who think that the economy underneath the economy is very weak and that we're, or we're, you know, if we, you know, you should be very scared about the world economy. And, and I look at, the housing market. And, you know, if that goes up eight or 9%, you know, 33, $34 trillion market goes up eight or 9%, it's like $3 trillion. You have the Biden administration talking about another 1.9 trillion. We just passed a trillion, you know, how much was spent last year. Um, and I think about what all the rest of the world is doing. Then a post COVID world, you could have this kind of tsunami this summer where the spending is just absurd. Well, and, and am, the other I, am I wrong is, thinking about that? Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, if you look at checking and savings accounts, those are about one and a half to two trillion dollars higher than you would expect on trend, which is from people saving their stimulus money and not being able to spend money on travel and dining. So that's another couple trillion dollars that is fuel for the fire. And so I think to your point, I, 
you know, we're going to get out of this. And I mean, obviously, we both know there are a tremendous number of people who continue to suffer. Um, yes, but, of course. But for homeowners in the upper middle class and those who have kept their jobs, there's going to be so much money that it's sort of the, the biggest, you know, damper on on spending and growth and inflation might just be what people are willing to spend culturally. Like, you, you sort of think, okay, a, a burger at a restaurant, a burger and fries, if a sit-down restaurant, maybe it's 15 bucks. And, you know, if, if a restaurant tries to charge you 20, are you going to balk or are you going to be happy that you can go to a restaurant? Or if you want to go to Disney World with your family and it costs whatever, 2,000 bucks, I don't know, I've been to Disney World, and they charge 3,000, are you going to say, I'm not going or are you just going to pay? And so there's so much money that it won't be the economics that holds us back. It's going to be what are people comfortable spending or relative to what they're used to things costing, I think. It'll be interesting to see how fast some of the really hard hit parts of the economy can rebound in terms of capacity, whether it's just eating out uh, venues, uh, the wedding industry, I think about airlines. And I just don't think, I mean, I think that if if we get va- if the vaccines continue to be rolled at some point this summer, you're going to have kind of wide open uh, travel. But how fast can some of these places add staff, pilots? You know, yeah. Well, and I, and all I think- these things. I, I don't know the answer to that, but that'll be another limiting factor. Well, and, and we're used to this very you know, the 2010s were a real foodie culture where restaurants tried to up their game with fancy menus and ingredients and and things like that. And it might just be that you're taking all these shuttered restaurants and saying, okay, how fast can we open up a a tacos and margarita place or a burgers and fries place just to meet that demand in a way that, you know, it's basically how can, you know, we need to staff this place with very inexperienced people. So what, what menu can we serve to meet this demand? And it's, all right, we can get teenagers to work a, you know, burger and a fry place. And it's, we just have a very simple, you know, dining industry for a year while we staff up. What, what is the most uh, interesting thing that you see either politically or investing that we haven't talked about or that isn't on people's radar screens right now? I think that the narrative has become very much about remote work and moving to, to trendy second tier cities like Austin and Nashville and Miami and, and places like that. And at least for a period of time, the story might actually be that New York and San Francisco are the bargains. And I don't mean that they're going to be cheaper than Austin, but if you think that those cities deserve any kind of premium for you know what they have to offer, whether it's infrastructure, jobs, uh, amenities, I mean, you're going to be getting, in, in a way, the investing parallel might be you know, why pay 12 times earnings for value stock if you can get a quality growth stock at 14 or 15 times earnings? And so, you know, if I were young or opportunistic, I would probably move to New York or San Francisco because I think that those are relatively cheap compared to where the the second tier cities have gone price-wise. I'm glad you said that. The other thing that I'm really excited about is just, I want to hear how many people are moving to Miami in July. I don't want to right. hear about how many people are moving to Miami when it has perfect weather in December and January. It literally is like perfect weather. I grew up in South Florida and for six months of the year, it is oppressively hot. So it'll be really interesting to hear how many people. And at the same time, it'll be a, it's a wonderful time to go to like New York or San Francisco. The other thing that I think about is that in a reopened economy, you're gonna, people are gonna wanna be together and close and dense, and they're gonna want to really in, go to concerts and bars. And you could see this explosion of urban interest where all these, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, are suddenly getting jobs and leaving where their parents are in the suburbs and heading right where the action is. I mean, that's and, what and I would be gonna, doing if I was in my yeah. 20s probably a lot of new business formation and maybe these old crusty places that, I mean, some were establishments that people are going to miss, but some of them might've just been, you know, kind of subpar businesses with leases. And so I I think it's going to be a a ton of creative energy unleashed on cities that have been expensive and maybe kind of stagnant for a long time. That that's uh, yeah, no, I, I, I would agree. If people wanted to uh, find you, Connor, they somehow didn't know you. 
um, how, how, well, how best to find you or to get in contact with you? Is this on Twitter? The, yeah, the easiest way is on Twitter and then just look for my Bloomberg columns, which I, I try to write two a week. So that's sort of, I get pretty close to that. Um, but I think this is going to be a really interesting year, hopefully a much better year than we've seen in a long time and looking forward to, you know, hopefully being in a much better place three, six months from now than we are right now. And they would find you at Connor Sen. That's right. right? Yep. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. We have to do this again, especially maybe later this summer, and see if your thesis is, I was say, is, I mean, is playing out. Opportunity to see, yeah, the fiscal versus uh, you know stimulating markets. Look, look forward to seeing how it goes. You know, one last thought that I would just say is what's really interesting, and I I, I have to find it, but I saw some study of like a higher inflation environment. Um, and I want to say it was in Mexico before they really experienced massive inflation. And what was really fascinating is that when inflation first started going, um, stocks actually surged. They went, they went nuts. And it wasn't until the super crazy inflation came right. that they plunged. Yeah. And so when a lot of people think, you know, to your point, the fiscal stimulus may actually propel the stock market to gains that- And, we... and I think it might, because it's sort of, at first, everyone thinks, well, my company has pricing power. And you don't That's think right. about what that means if yeah. everybody has pricing power. So yeah, it'll be really good. We should do this in about six months to see Sounds where great. we are. Um, right. And I really, I really appreciate it. Good chatting, Aaron. Okay. All right.